My husband and I, uh, my, uh, my husband died a year ago, and Rick had asked me to come out actually uh, a couple, of, a few years ago, and uh, at that time my husband was too ill to come. My husband had Alzheimer's, and it was a very low, long, slow, hard thing, and, uh, but he died last year. Um, so he's happy with the Lord, and I just have to deal with life now. But, um, so I'm glad I finally was able to make it out here. I want to tell you a little about uh, how uh, Gerald and I got involved in dealing with Mormonism and why we spent our lifetime on this. Uh, I'm from a fifth-generation Mormon family. I'm a direct descendant of Brigham Young. My mother's maiden name was Young. I knew my great-grandma Young, uh, who was a last living polygamist wife of Brigham Young, Jr., uh, son of President Brigham Young, and um, so my sister and I grew up in a Mormon home. Uh, my folks were married in the Salt Lake Temple, but um, as the years went by, uh, my mother started to have questions about uh, different aspects of Mormon claims, and I know one of the things that bothered her was the Mormon temple ritual. Now, if anyone here is Mormon, I'm not going to go into the details of the ritual, don't worry. Uh, but it, it, there were elements of the temple ritual that did bother my mother, and the start of her questions came from those things, well, also from polygamy. Uh, uh, some Mormons um, aren't that aware of polygamous past of Mormonism, but when you're a descendant of Brigham Young and you know your great-grandma who was a polygamist, I mean, you kind of know this. You know, it's not, <laughs> not something that's uh, hard to miss. So... There were elements of this that bothered my mother. When uh, I got into uh, junior high and high school, my mother's questions were getting uh, more specific. And uh, some of you may have heard of Fawn Brody's book, uh, the best biography that's been done so far on Joseph Smith, called uh, No Man Knows My History. And that came out in about 1945. And when my mother read that, that started her in a quest to find out how the Mormon story really first happened. Because in this biography, you get a different telling of the story than you get officially in Mormonism. And this becomes one of the problems for anyone that starts looking into the background of Mormonism. There is the official version, and then there is a historical picture that seems to run counter to a lot of what the official literature says. And my mother was finding this contradiction of things that she would see in history books that would not be in official Mormon literature. And she was trying to get to the bottom of that. <clears throat> when um, I was in high school, I went to the Mormon seminary, which uh, if you know anything about Mormonism, I assume they have it over here in the islands too, uh, is off-campus religious training for high schoolers. Uh, the Mormons in uh, Utah are very faithful with this, and in California, the kids... Uh, I went, we went at six in the morning to seminary uh, before going to high school. I went through the seminary program and graduated from it. But while I was in seminary, my mother's questions started growing, and she, <laughs> she started uh, saying to me, well, wh when you go to seminary tomorrow, why don't you ask your teacher about this or that or the other, you know? And, and uh, uh, so I'm this dumb uh, high schooler with big eyes and, so I go to seminary, you know, and it's like, well, uh, my mother said, you know, so uh, and I started getting in trouble uh, <laughs> asking my mom's questions. And um, I wasn't getting anywhere on any answers. Now, one of the problems, that, one of the questions that came up, I don't know how much you know about Mormon doctrine, but in Mormonism, they make God the Father and Jesus Christ totally separate people. They both have physical resurrected bodies and have actual form, size, dimension, and exist in time. 
And they believe in the Old Testament that Elohim is God the Father and Jehovah is God the Son. So you really have two gods in Mormonism mentioned in the Old Testament. So when I'm studying Old Testament this year in seminary, uh, the question, uh, well, the teaching came up that when Moses talked to the Lord face to face, who is he talking to? Is he talking to Elohim or Jehovah? If you're going to make them separate gods, who is he talking to? Well, so my, this was my mother's question to me. When you go to seminary tomorrow, ask the teacher, how do you know when it's Elohim or Jehovah? Well, in seminary, they were saying that Elohim, uh, being God the Father, that the way that we can prove that God the Father has a physical form is that Moses talked to the Lord face to face. And so he's talking to God the Father face to face, and this shows us that God has a physical form and his physical body and everything. So my mom's question is, okay, but most of the time the Mormons say that Jehovah is the God in the Old Testament, so how do you know which days the guy talking to the prophets is Jehovah or Elohim? What's the determining factor? How do we know that Moses was talking to Elohim as opposed to Jehovah? Okay, so I go to seminary, it's my hand. Okay, how do we know when it's Elohim or Jehovah? If Moses is talking to the Lord face to face, who's he talking to? Is that Elohim or Jehovah? Yeah. Okay, so uh, my teacher gave me this rambling answer of, well, most of the time it's Jehovah, but once in a while it's Elohim. And this is one of the times when it's Elohim. I said, well, yeah, but how'd you know that? And she said, well, you just know that because the brethren have always told us this is the time when it's Elohim and the rest of the time it's Jehovah. And I thought, well, uh, I don't think that's going to convince my mother because it wasn't based on any reason of why it would be one and not the other. So uh, she asked me later if I asked in seminary about it, and I said, oh, no, I was too busy. We didn't get around to that because uh, I knew she wouldn't buy the answer. Well, so then I graduated from seminary uh, when I was in the 11th grade. Well, I have to tell you also, my brother, who's eight years younger than me, uh, was sent to a Christian school. Now, he was not sent to a Christian school because it was a Christian school. That was something they overlooked. Uh, but they had a wonderful preschool, and my mom was working, so they sent him to this preschool that happened to be run by a Christian church. And as he came along through school, he was shorter than all the other kids, and so if she would have put him back into the public school system as he got older, he would have been advanced to grade because he'd been getting such a good education, but he's already short for his age, so then he's going to be twice as short as everybody. So she kept him in the Christian school. <laughs> Uh, it's by the fact that it was Christian. And, um, well, okay, so uh, one day we get this notice home that they're having some sort of meetings at John's school. My mom asked me if I want to go. And I thought, yeah, we got to go find out what kind of place he's going to. So uh, we go to this meeting. Well, I mean, you know, you could have said revival, and I wouldn't have known what the word was. Uh, Mormons don't have revivals. And so uh, there's a meeting, and so we go to this meeting, and uh, they had these people playing uh, instruments and singing. The thing that impacted me was the worship, uh, the genuineness of the people that were singing. Uh, that spoke to me. I didn't understand any of their words. I didn't understand the songs. I did not understand the service. Uh, they had a lot of people go forward, and I wouldn't have understood what that was about. They had an altar call, but I wouldn't have known. Mormons don't have altar calls, so, I mean, this was all foreign to me. All I know is they sang some songs, people went to the front, and they took them down in some little side room and disappeared. Uh, you know, so uh, they, don't, they don't come out. <laughs> you know, they just, that's it. And so I, I don't know what it was all about, but uh, there was this really loving spirit there that spoke to me. Well, anyways, uh, graduated from seminary in the 11th grade. Uh, oh, I have to tell you about, I forgot to tell you about in the 8th grade. This is in Southern California. So I'm the minority down there. Uh, Mormons have grown since I was a kid. Well, everything's, you know, I mean, we're talking dark ages. But uh, back then, <laughs> uh, the Mormons were very much a minority in California. And one day, uh, this little girl comes up to me in gym class, and she says, Sandra, I understand you're a Mormon. I said, yeah. And she says, can you tell me about the Mormon view of God? So I'm trying to think, okay, what do I say to her to give her, you know, 
really capsule thing here. So I said to her this little phrase that I had grown up learning that's common in Mormonism, at least it used to be, uh, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. Now think about that. This is a standard, well-known phrase. Younger people may not know it, but the older, people, older Mormons know this. As man is, God once was. What is that telling you about God? That God was once a human being on God the Father, not Jesus. God the Father was once a human being on another earth system. Died, resurrected, went to heaven. We don't know how many millions of years it took till he finally became a God and was able to start his own world. So as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. So what is that telling you about man? Man has the potential to someday become a God over a world, just like Heavenly Father is running this one. Okay, so this is my big answer. <laughs> Eighth grade, uh, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become. And this girl stood there and looked at me, and she said, Sandra, that's blasphemy, and walked away. <laughs> and I'm standing here trying to think that one through, you know, and I said, well, no, it makes sense to me. So I didn't know what her problem was. Um, but I give this girl credit that she understood, an eighth grader, she understood when I said that that it was not biblical. Now, what would have helped is if she would have said, Sandra, I got an idea for you. Go home and read Isaiah 43, 10, and 11. See, that would have been a clue. So I encourage you to, as you have a chance, to share it with your faith with your Mormon friends. Give them a few clues. Uh, just to tell them it's blasphemy. It doesn't quite get the message across. you know. So, uh, However, God uses what we say and... I believe even um, less than perfect witnessing is used by God. And I want you to be encouraged in sharing your faith. Uh, I'm not trying to discourage you. I want you to be encouraged to say something because you don't know what will speak to someone and make them think about it through the years that God will use. God used that girl's statement because for years I puzzled over why she was offended. Now, I knew she was not making fun of my religion. I did not take offense at her because it was a genuine response. I knew she was just curious, uh, but uh, you know, I didn't understand why she would think that was so bad. So it took me a while to, to get a handle on that one. Okay, 12th grade, I start Mormon Institute of Religion. That's their off-campus college education for religion. And uh, so I start taking that. Everything's going fine um, then. But then in my first year of college, I, I'm into my second year now of Institute of Religion classes, and by now some of the things my mother had asked me along the way were starting to seep in, and I'm starting to think, gee, I wonder what the answers to those things really are. So I start asking questions in, in Institute. You know, I have to raise my hand and ask a question, and, and then finally one day the Institute teacher says, Sandra, you've got to stay after class. And I said, okay. And so I go up and, you know, so uh, what do you want to talk to me about? And he says, you have got to stop asking questions in Institute. You are causing a girl to question the church who's just about to join. And I'm thinking, well, can't we just answer the question? <laughs> no, you are not going to ask them anymore. You know, okay. So, um, so it's starting to build, you know. Well, I was going with a fellow that was going to BYU. Now, for the young people here, I'm sure that you have no thoughts of, of going to college to look for a mate uh, or to flirt or anything, you know. But, but I was worried when he went to BYU that uh, girls there are probably going to be flirting with him. And uh, so I thought I had to go to Salt Lake and remind him what I look like because <laughs> I was living in Southern California. See? Um, so I, I went up to, on the pretext of seeing my Dear Grandma, um, and he had saw my boyfriend, and he was looking at the girls, and they were looking at him, and we broke up. And uh, so, then my grandma asks me if I would take her to a meeting, and I didn't know what kind of meeting this was. She made it sound like it was some sort of Mormon meeting of some kind, but she wouldn't tell me what it was. So I thought, mm, okay, this must be a bunch of old fogies, and she doesn't want to tell me what, it's, what it really is going to be because I won't take her if she tells me, you know, everyone's going to be over 60. 
you know. Uh, I finally said, okay, Grandma, I don't know what we're going to, but yeah, I'll take you to a meeting. So we go across town. We go, I go up and I knock on this door, and this tall, nice-looking young man answers the door, and his name is Gerald Tanner. And I immediately got interested in this meeting. Uh, <laughs> yes, you know, okay. So <laughs> um, I'd like to say I was on a big spiritual quest, you know, but I mean, <laughs> that's the way it really happened. So I'm at this meeting, and Gerald uh, is uh, on his way out of the LDS faith. He, as a young teenager, had uh, been in a slight rebellious mode, and instead of going to priesthood meeting, him and some of the other guys would get together behind the ward house instead and smoke. Uh, Now, they all believed the church was true, but they didn't want to live the standards, you know, so Gerald's kind of in this rebellious teen mode, when his bishop starts making these little innuendos that getting time for that mission, you know, time to straighten up here, about time for that mission. And uh, so Gerald's trying to think through, do I, mission, you know, do I want to go on a mission? So he starts looking more seriously at his faith. Now, I'd always assumed Mormonism was true, but he hadn't really looked into it. So he read the Book of Mormon, cover to cover, like they say, pray about it, you know, and he did, and he thought it was true. Uh, And then he started looking into some other aspects of Mormonism, and he looked in the Encyclopedia Britannica on the article on Mormonism, and it mentioned there were different kinds. There isn't just the Utah kind of Mormon. There's all kind of splinter groups of Mormonism. Well, no one had ever told him about this. And he read about the reorganized LDS church. And uh, so he asked his mom about him, and you'd have thought he said a dirty word, you know. I mean, oh, we don't talk about them. He said, well, what is the reorganized LDS church? Oh, well, they're a splinter group. You know, well, they... they, uh, make up all kind of lies, and they, they don't follow the truth. Well, now he's curious, you know. So he looks in the phone book. Sure enough, there's an RLDS church in Salt Lake. So he decides to go visit them. Well, here's the pastor of the organized church who thinks, hot dog, here's a young man who's open to the truth. So he gets hold of Gerald and starts plying him with literature that shows him everything that's wrong with Brigham Young. Why, that Brigham Young taught all kind of sermons that went against what Joseph Smith said. So... Gerald, what you need to do is throw out all of Utah Mormonism, all of Brigham Young, and go back to just the Joseph Smith brand, and that's the true stuff. This throws Gerald into a searching mode to try to figure out which of the splinter groups of Mormonism is telling the truth. So this is the beginning of his research on the history of Mormonism. He gets so curious about this whole thing, he made a couple of trips to Independence, Missouri to visit some of the splinter groups, and... Through this process, he came to faith in Christ, but he still was hanging on to parts of Mormonism. So when I meet him at this meeting, he's having at his folks' basement, much to the chagrin of his poor mother, who was livid that he's having an apostate meeting in the basement. But uh, uh, Gerald's there trying to tell everyone, the Book of Mormon's true, it's just all the other stuff that's wrong. Throw everything else out and just have the Book of Mormon. Okay, some of the stuff that they, they talked about at this meeting were things that my mother had said to me. Um, so it wasn't like shock fill, you know. I mean, I would heard some of this stuff bandied about, but I'd never, I mean, my mom wasn't cute like Gerald, you know. Uh, people say, uh, you know, how can I witness to my family? And I said, you know, how do, how do, who witnessed to you? And I said, well, you know, it's not a, 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 it's not a method I can manufacture and promote, you know, as a, Here's the ten rules. Of, if you follow what Gerald did, it works every time. You know, well, you got to be cute and single, <laughs> and the one you're witnessing to has got to be single. And so, yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, so, so I'm at this meeting, and I broke up with my boyfriend, and here's this cute guy. And so after the meeting, I said, "Oh, Gerald, that was so interesting. Why don't you go to my grandma's and tell me some more about it?" You know. So Gerald thinks I'm really interested, and. Uh, <laughs> He comes over to my grandma's house later, and he's got all these books with him. And I think, oh, my goodness, we're really going to talk religion, you know. <laughs> and, um, and we did. Uh, so uh, I invite him back another night, and uh, we just talked religion. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really hard on a girl's ego, uh, I'll tell you. But uh, about the third meeting, I thought, you know, I better start paying attention here. <laughs> I can't keep faking these answers in this discussion. 
so he finally got me looking at what he's talking about. One of the things Gerald challenged me on was that Joseph Smith had rewritten his revelations. Now, in a Christian perspective, we take the Bible as the word of God and feel that what we need for our eternal life has been laid out in that Bible. But in Mormonism, they don't believe the Bible's reliable. Although they say they use it, it is taken as they have four books of Scripture, and the Bible is the least reliable. They have the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, three different scriptures. A lot of people are just aware of the Book of Mormon. They have two others. The Book of Mormon is really um, like the worm on the hook to get you to swallow Mormonism, but that's not where they get their main doctrine from. The main doctrine comes from the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. So anyways, uh, in Mormonism, you're raised with this assumption the Bible's not reliable, it's been changed so much, but now we have a prophet of God who gives us the straight scoop, and so now we've got a real reliable message. So Gerald says to me, well, you know, of course, that uh, Joseph Smith rewrote his revelations. They, they don't read the same today as they did in the first printing when Joseph Smith first printed them. And I thought, well, that's something I can check out for myself. So I went down to the bookstore, and I bought a reprint of the first printing of Joseph Smith's Revelations. And I came home with it, and I asked my grandma if she would read with me the first edition against the current one. And as I worked through this and saw how Joseph Smith was changing the wording, I thought, this cannot be the creator of the universe giving this message. I think he could do it right the first time. It's like creating the world and then saying, you know, ten days later, oh, I forgot gravity, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think God would know how to give it right the first time around, you know. And so as I read the Doctrine and Covenants and I saw him changing the wording, uh, well, now the Mormons will say to me, when I bring this up to them, many times they'll say, well, we believe God adds line upon line, precept upon precept. And so he gave Joseph further light. And I said, but you can't give further light if the first time God said this was the straight scoop. So that when he first printed his revelations, the first section in the original printing of his revelation said all the things written in herein was uh, good and faithful and true and you should rely on the things that are written then how could you three years later go and rewrite the same revelations why would god have said for the first printing that everything was good if in fact it was written wrong or insufficient and he was going to update it all and change it all in just a few years so i thought oh, there's something wrong with this picture well then i started telling gerald how i'm a descendant of brigham young and he says, oh, you know, and he says, well, have you ever read any of Brigham Young's sermons? And I said, no. And he said, would you read some if I brought them over? See, I didn't know I was getting set up. And uh, uh, I said, yeah, there's not too many of them, you know. I'm not going to make a career out of this, uh, famous last words. Um, <laughs> and so he brings over several volumes of the Journal of Discourses. This is a Mormon 26-volume set of all the early church leader sermons. And uh, so he brings over several volumes. He got little tabs in it. He says, these are Brigham Young's most famous sermons. And since you're a direct descendant, you ought to at least read his most famous ones. And I thought, well, that's fair. Okay, so here's the sermon that says that uh, Adam is our father and our God. And I thought, well, I don't teach that in seminary. So Brigham Young had a whole different doctrine of God than what the Mormons teach today. And if I bring this up to a Mormon, they say, oh, well, that was just Brigham Young. That was his idea. I said, no, no, no. He's the prophet of God. He's standing in the pulpit at conference, annual meeting of the church, and he gets up and preaches that Adam is our God. This, to me, is a huge problem on this guy being a prophet of God if he's teaching false doctrine. But they, they want to just dismiss that that was his personal opinion. Okay, so anyways, here's these sermons on Adam as our father and our God. Then we get to the sermons on polygamy, where Brigham says the only men that can become gods are polygamists. Well, I don't teach that today. By the way, they still really believe polygamy, in case you don't know this. They just don't practice it now. But in the Doctrine and Covenants it's, uh, today, it still has section 132, which is the section on polygamy. They still believe they will practice it in heaven, although they don't believe it now. I mean, they don't practice it now. They all still believe it. And if a man outlives his wife, he can go to the temple and be sealed to his next wife. And by Mormon standards, he will be a polygamist in heaven with both of those women sealed to him. And this happened to our own grandfather, 
uh, Grandpa McGee, he outlived his first wife, married an old spinster school teacher that had never been married before, sealed in the temple to her. By Mormon standards, he's now a polygamist in heaven with two wives. Uh, so it's still part of the program. <clears throat> so uh, Gerald showed me these sermons about uh, the only men who become gods are polygamous. Uh, and I don't know how many of you understand that the Mormon goal is to become a god. They believe that someday you can... Men, God, and angels are all the same species in Mormonism. And so you have the same potential as Jesus and God. Given enough years and enough effort, men can become gods. And the wife, as a wife to a god, becomes a sort of goddess, but she doesn't really have any power, but she gets the title. Uh, but the men can actually go on to run a world. So hey, here's these sermons about uh, men becoming gods if they practice polygamy. And I thought, well, I don't teach that in uh, Sunday school these days. Um, so we're going through these different dots. Oh, another one he had was um, the Civil War will never free the slave. You know, that one kind of missed. Uh, but the, the real corker was when we got to the sermons on blood atonement. Now, I don't know how many of you heard about... Uh, this is the 150th anniversary of the Mountain Meadow Massacre uh, in Utah, where the uh, Mormons back in 1857 massacred 120 innocent uh, Gentiles. That's non-Mormons uh, that were coming through from Arkansas. Uh, and this is the big anniversary year for this. And there was a movie that just came out, September Dawn. I don't even know if it hit the theaters over here. Uh, but the Mountain Meadow Massacre is a big... Um, blight on Mormon history where they um, they became uh, the persecutors of the outside. The Mormons always want to talk about the persecution they endured in Missouri and Illinois, but they don't talk about the time when they had the power. They became the religious persecutors of the minorities that came through their own territory. So here's Brigham Young's sermons on blood atonement. And this is almost verbatim. One of his sermons, he says, let me suppose a case. Suppose I found my brother in bed with my wife. See, okay, adultery. Suppose I found my brother in bed with my wife. I would immediately put a javelin through both of them. And I would be justified, and this would save them and send them to the celestial kingdom. And uh, further on in the sermon, he says, there are certain sins that a man can commit that the blood of Christ will not cover, and your own blood has to be shed for that sin. There are various sermons. This isn't just one. These are various sermons that he preached. Uh, the Mormons will say to me, well, there's no evidence they ever blood atoned anyone. I believe there is. I believe I can historically document, yes, there have been cases of blood atonement uh, and revenge killings in early Mormonism. They don't do it today. Obviously, they don't do it today because I'm still alive, right? Okay, so, so I'm living proof they don't do it anymore. But Gerald's showing me all these sermons, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, we got some big headaches here, you know. So at this point, I realize I'm going to have to take a serious look at Mormonism. It isn't just my mom was bringing up problem areas, and not just that Gerald was bringing up problem areas. I started to see these problems myself. But along the way, Gerald also started talking to me about faith in Christ. The following Christ was different than being a member of a church. That salvation through Christ was a very different thing than baptism and church involvement. And in Mormonism, everything centers around church. Everything centers around this community. Uh, if you listen to Mormon testimonies, uh, they almost always focus around, uh, I um, know this is the only true church. I know that Joseph Smith's the only true prophet. And they center around this verbiage. And you're trained from a little child to repeat these phrases over and over and over and over. Uh, but as a Christian... Our faith is not in men, not in anyone on earth. It is all in Christ and what has been revealed in the Bible. So as Gerald's talking with me, I'm starting to see that this is a little different picture of Christianity than I had got as a Mormon. Well, Gerald and I had a whirlwind romance and uh, knew each other exactly uh, two and a half months when we got married. And... Uh, and I left the church. Now, you can imagine this probably was not the way to make friends and influence people. Um, my parents were just a tad upset about this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, we have enough trouble with our young people anyways, you know. But when suddenly someone changes their whole religion <laughs> and it's going with some kid that's an apostate, uh, it's kind of a culture shock. But 
I have a better appreciation at this point in my life of what I put my parents through than I did at the time. Uh, anyways, so when Gerald and I uh, started visiting around different churches after we got married, of course, we have this problem. We're still believing in the Book of Mormon. We just think the rest of us wrong. So we don't fit anywhere. <laughs> uh, then as the, uh, ne- over the next couple of years, we had different people that we would meet and talk with along the way that would challenge us on the Book of Mormon. And they would say, well, why do you believe the Book of Mormon? If you can see that there's something wrong with the rest of Mormonism, why do you think that anything is true in it? Why, why do you hold on to the Book of Mormon? So then we started looking into that to try to see, okay, does it meet a, a test? Is, is it anything like the Bible? And the more we looked into this, we realized we got some real problems here. And if you ever look in, a, uh, in the Mormon scriptures, you will find at the back, they have maps to help you understand Joseph's Revelation. So they'll show you maps of New York and Ohio and Missouri and Utah to show you how the Mormons moved across the plains and came out to Utah. But there are no maps for the Book of Mormon. Now, if the Book of Mormon is history, like the Bible, why aren't, aren't there any maps for it? The Mormons cannot agree on where the story happened. For uh, over 100 years, the Mormons have been sending missionaries to the islands to convince the natives that they are descended from the people of the Book of Mormon. And their old Mormon view was that all Indians of North and South America and the islanders are all descended from the Book of Mormon people, feeling that there was a migration from uh, North and South America to the islands. Well, we know now that's not the way the migration worked. But, that, but that's the view in the Book of Mormon. Well, I shouldn't say the Book of Mormon. That's the view of the early Mormon church leaders. Now you have a problem because at BYU today, the Mormon scholars are limiting Book of Mormon lands down to just Mexico and Guatemala because they realize there are problems with the story being historical over too big a land mass. Uh, for one problem, you have the problem of language. There's too much diversity in the languages in North and South America to feel that they all were Hebrew people speaking Hebrew uh, although they wrote in a reformed Egyptian, up until 421 A.D. when they all get killed off. And then when the Spaniards come just a thousand years later, that isn't enough time to lose all trace of Hebrew. It isn't enough time for all the diversity of language in the Americas. So the Mormon scholars now are trying to shrink the Book of Mormon lands down to this little area so that it doesn't have so many language problems. But it gives you other problems. Uh, another reason to shrink the Book of Mormon lands is the travel problem. In the Book of Mormon, you have the armies in the Book of Mormon go- going clear across uh, uh, Central America and going clear up to New York to fight the great last battle in the Book of Mormon. Well, the last battle in the Book of Mormon has tens of thousands of people being killed on both sides. This is a heck of an army to march across the country. The supply lines would be... Uh, a tremendous problem to get this big an army up to New York to fight these big battles. Why would you pick New York? I mean, if you're already in Mexico, why New York? Why that little hill? I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of the Hill Camorra in New York, but this is not something to write home about. You know, I mean, it's it's just a little hill. Uh, And uh, boy, they're going to have their great last battle at this place. So you, we see in Mormonism today this, this response to criticism where they're trying to find answers to make it make sense, but they will give you no map, there's no artifact. And as we were challenged as young people, we started looking into these things. Okay, where did the Book of Mormon happen? Why aren't there any artifacts? And the more we started looking into the Bible, we realized, okay, our Bible has maps. They have all kind of artifacts. They have all kind of manuscripts. It does, you could be a total atheist and you can go to school and study Hebrew and Greek, but you can't go to any university and stru- study Reformed Egyptian. You cannot study the language of the Book of Mormon. You cannot find any place that's got a manuscript for the people group that this claims to be. But not only that, we started finding all the problems with the internal story. The Book of Mormon has them going to war with horses and chariots. Now, trust me, the American Indians did not have horses and chariots. And there's not an anthropologist outside of Mormonism that's going to tell you that the Mayans ever had horses and chariots. And yet in that same area as the Mayans, the Mormons want to place the Book of Mormon story. And it's a necessary part of the story that the, the leaders of the armies have horses and chariots. 
So there's all kinds of elements within the Book of Mormon that don't fit. And as we started studying more and more on the Bible, the more we started realizing, hey, the Book of Mormon isn't measuring up to these things. Another problem we started to see is how much the Book of Mormon plagiarizes the Bible. It plagiarizes the King James Bible, <laughs> not just the NIV or something. You know, it's King James Bible. And so Jesus is supposed to appear here in the Americas, and he gives the same Sermon on the Mount here in the Americas as he gave in Jerusalem. But the problem is he gives Matthew's King James Sermon on the Mount. And so when you're looking at it, you think, oh, wait a minute. You know, uh, you couldn't have these people speaking Hebrew translated into Reformed Egyptian, then have Joseph Smith translate it back into English and have it coming out exactly King James English. Translation doesn't work that way. So the more we looked into this, the, the greater the problems came. Uh, as for myself, on um, when I came to faith in Christ, it was through listening to a Christian radio station. And this one day the minister uh, that was on at that time came on, uh, and he was speaking from uh, 1 John 4. And uh, this is one of the passages that he was preaching on. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Uh, and then further down it says, we love him because he first loved us. And as this minister talked about that, I started putting the pieces together in my mind how different that was than the Mormon concept of God and salvation. That I have been in rebellion against God, doing my own thing, God reached out in love when I was in rebellion. Whereas in Mormonism, you're the same species as God, so you expect God to love you. And it doesn't amount to this great thing because you weren't in rebellion. <laughs> you did a little few things wrong, but, you know, it wasn't the same concept. So as I started to see this, as this minister preached on this, I realized that I really had a need for Christ, that I had not made a submission to God as a Mormon like this was talking about, like Gerald had been talking to me. And so through listening to this radio station that gave my heart to Christ, but I still believe the Book of Mormon. And I want to encourage you as you talk with your Mormon friends or share your faith with, with anybody, we don't see all our error at once. Anyone that has been very deeply into any kind of false teaching takes time to work through that. If you were a missionary to any indigenous people, wherever it was, uh, they would have cultural things that would be hard for them to work through and to come to a full understanding of what the Bible's talking about. So there were things that we had to take time to work through. Well, as we were working through all of this and doing our research, we started writing it all up for our family and friends so they'd understand. We, were, you know, It looked like we lost our mind, but we wanted them to know this wasn't a sudden decision. It wasn't something we did flippantly. It was something we very sincerely prayed about and studied and we felt we could show them and list out the references on all the things we were saying. If we talked about changes in Mormonism, we could tell them where the documents were, what page to look on. And if we're talking about the Bible talking something different than Mormonism, I want to be able to give them the Bible verses for that. So we start writing this all up, and we mimeograph stuff, and we send it to everybody. Uh, how to win friends and influence people, you know. I sent it to everybody on the ward list, every Mormon I knew, all the apostles of the Mormon church in Salt Lake, and, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> well, the exuberance of youth. Uh, and, and so then people would say to me, you know, we were just two dumb kids. And they'd say, well, uh, the church has answers for all of that. that you know, and they just dismiss it all. And we thought, well, okay, we didn't give them enough references. Well, well we're going to go look at this up further. And we're gonna, uh, instead of one reference, we're going to give them three. So then we'd go back, we'd document everything, and we'd get it all, we'd send it out to everybody, and they still say we're crazy. And so we thought, okay, we're going to give them six. We'll go find six references on every topic so they can't just dismiss it. So the rest is history. We ended up spending the rest of our lives trying to find more references so they can't say it was just our opinion, you know. Uh, we've, uh, through the years, seen many people come out of Mormonism. We've seen them come to faith in Christ. And I realize for a Mormon that's a very hard thing because... It, for, to hear me say that, because they feel they already are Christians, and they will point to the fact that it has the name of Jesus Christ in their church name. Uh, but even the Muslims will talk about Jesus, and the Jesus is mentioned in the Koran, 
But the Jesus of the Muslim is not the Jesus of the Bible. And my challenge would be the Jesus of Mormonism is not the Jesus of the Bible. And so while I recognize the Mormons' devotion, their sincerity, I don't feel that it's in accord with what God has given us in the Bible. And a matter of fact, much of the Book of Mormon doesn't contain the doctrine of Mormonism. They are really depending on the Doctrine of Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. And sometimes I'll have some, a Mormon come in the bookstore and talk with me, and uh, they'll want to know if I read and prayed about the Book of Mormon. And I said, yes, and I feel God told me it wasn't true. And then they say, well, you didn't pray sincerely. <laughs> and I said, well, I prayed as sincerely as I knew how. Um, but I said, what, what do you think is more important about the Book of Mormon? That I accept it as history or that I accept the doctrine in the Book of Mormon? Because I think I already believe more of the doctrine in the Book of Mormon than the average Mormon does. I just don't believe it's history. So which do you think would be more important? And this puts them on the horn of a dilemma. You know, they can't say, well, it's more important to believe it's history. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's got to be important for its doctrine, or what was the point in saving the thing to bring it out, you know? So my challenge to the Mormon is, show me Mormonism in the Book of Mormon. There is nothing in the Book of Mormon that teaches their temple rituals, their sealing of the dead, their last uh, chance stuff for people that died out of the faith to be baptized and come into the faith after they've died. There's nothing in the Book of Mormon about those things. There's nothing in the Book of Mormon about three degrees of glory in heaven, uh, no preexistence other than Christ's preexistence in the Book of Mormon. Uh, so the Book of Mormon becomes the thing to hook you into Mormonism because it quotes a lot from the Bible and it sounds familiar to it, but then they're going to move you on to the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price once they get you in. So it's uh, a gradual pulling you in. The Mormons are, uh, have spent quite a bit of time trying to modify what they say publicly. They've just brought out a new book, uh, Teachings of the Presidents of the Church, Joseph Smith. And I thought it was interesting in reading this, that his most famous sermon on the nature of God, they only quote part of it, and they leave out part. And I think it's very instructive, the part they leave out. But even the part they use is uh, pretty revealing. And I want to read this to you. This is one of his most famous sermons uh, just uh, about a month before he died. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today and the great God who holds this world in orbit who holds all worlds and all things by his power, were to make himself visible. I say to you, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in form, like yourselves on all the person, image, and very form as a man. But what they've left out in giving you this part of the sermon is earlier where he says, I am going to tell you how God came to be God. And they don't print that part in here. Why not? Because they know the outside world sees that sentence and it puts you on notice there's something wrong with Mormonism. This isn't biblical. So they're very careful how they present Mormonism, even to their own people, editing his sermons to keep you from seeing the full extent of the heresy that he was really preaching. And uh, I had a Mormon lady come into the bookstore a few months ago. A Christian friend had brought her in. And, she said, and I told her I'd left Mormonism. And she said, well, why would you leave? And I said, well, for one thing, I don't uh, believe that the Mormon view of God is a Christian view and that Joseph Smith taught a wrong view of God. And she was, got all huffy, you know, well, how can you say that? What are you saying? And I said, so I mentioned the sermon that he gave where he said, I'm going to tell you how God came to be God. And she said, I've never heard that. And I said, well, you may not have heard it, but I can show you from the Mormon books where he said that. <laughs> oh, you know, uh, and I said, well, okay, have you heard the phrase, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may become? And she said, yeah, I've heard that before. I said, okay, explain to me what it means. And she just looked at me a minute, and I said, explain the first part. As man is, God once was. What does that tell you about God? And she just stood there a minute, and I said, isn't that part of that phrase saying that God at one time was a human being just like us? She said, well, yeah, I guess so. I said, okay. When God was on earth as a human being, who was in charge of that world? And she never thought about this before. I said, okay, when he's a human, there's got to be another God. So right there you got plural gods. God's a human. There's some other God in charge of that world. 
And finally she says, oh, well, okay, I guess that would be true. I said, all right. That God, was he once a human being? Well, I guess that would follow, she says. And I said, okay, so that God one time was a human. So who was the God in charge when that God was a human? Wouldn't there have to be another God in charge then? She said, well, yeah, I guess so. And I said, well, okay, then the God before him, you know, you get the picture. And I said, so, so from that we see this whole idea of multiple gods out there. We have a local deity that we're praying to that is all powerful for our sphere, but he is not the great God of the universe that the Christians are talking about. He is one of a pantheon of gods. So that in Mormonism, every god has a supervisor god on this eternal escalator to perfection, and each Man can get on at one level of the escalator and progress up, but you never pass up the God in front of you. So they are not saying you can become equal to God the Father because they don't believe you'll ever pass him by. Everybody's moving up on the escalator, and God becomes a more powerful God as he oversees a bigger, expanding universe. But the God above him is also overseeing a bigger, expanding universe. And men can get on somewhere along the line and eventually move up to the point where they get to be a God. And uh, so as I went through this with her, she said, well, I obviously need to go home and think about this more. (laughs) Uh, And I don't know what will happen to her. But this is a typical kind of conversation I have with people in my bookstore of trying to get them to think through what the Mormons are really saying about God, salvation, eternal life, uh, temple ritual. None of these things are in the Bible like they assume they are. And uh, back uh, in the... uh, Free papers back there, there's a little packet on sharing your faith with a Mormon, and in it is a little page on terminology differences. Because one of the problems you're going to find if you try to talk with a Mormon about the difference of the belief systems is the Mormons use Christian phrasing, but they've redefined all the words. So you don't ask a Mormon, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Because, yeah, they believe everyone will go to heaven. But then they've got heaven divided up into three levels, and you only get into the top level if you're a good Mormon and go to the temple all the time. So then the question is, well, where is that in the Bible? Of course, I can't come up with a verse. But you you need to understand that they have redefined all the terms so that that it sounds like they're saying something very Christian, but the meaning behind it all has been changed. So that will help you all uh, a lot in that. We have... uh, had a tremendous impact, I believe, through the years on Mormonism. Uh, But it's obviously growing, not growing as fast as they want to claim it is, but it is growing. I think a lot of that is internal growth from they have more children than everybody else. Um, so, So they got an internal growth. But we have a moral obligation as Christians to share our faith with all of those around us, not just the Mormons. But in order to share our faith with the Mormons, we need to understand that they are coming at this from a very different perspective than the Christian world. And if you're talking to a Mormon friend, you need to ask them to define their terms, to explain to you what they mean. If they say they're a Christian or if they, for instance, a common thing for a Mormon to say to me is, uh, why don't you accept us as Christians? I says, you don't accept me as a Christian. And they say, oh, no, we, we accept all you as Christians. I said, no, you don't really accept us as Christian. Because when I say I accept you as as someone as a Christian, I'm saying I accept that you have the same eternal life as I will have, that we all will share in the same eternal life with God the Father. But you're not saying that with me. Only Mormons who are temple-worthy and active in Mormonism will have eternal life. This is one of the word differences. Eternal life is someone who is married in the temple and the ability to procreate in giving life to more spirits throughout eternity. That's eternal life. They believe you will have immortality, you will go to heaven, but you will not have eternal life. So they redefine these words. So the question is not, uh, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Uh, It's not, if you died today, would you be with Jesus? Because they would think that would be true of all of you. But the question is, if you died tonight, would you know you would have eternal life? Because they don't know that. You cannot know you have eternal life until you get to the end of your life and everything's tallied up to see Uh, if if you've measured up to the full thing. So I think we have a beautiful face to share with them. Uh, Forgiveness of sin is a wonderful thing that the Mormon doesn't understand because in Mormonism you sin, you have to go to the bishop and confess your sin. You're given a year probation if it was adultery or something. Uh, And you have to have this process 
to be forgiven. Uh, there's not a sense that you personally, individually could go to God about those things and have immediate forgiveness. Uh, I had a Mormon fellow in the other day that was seeking, and we talked some about grace. Um, and one of the things that's in here uh, in this uh, sharing with Mormons thing, uh, it, I tell about a parable that's in one of their student manuals where a current Mormon apostle says, let me give you a parable of the atonement. And the parable is that this foolish man gets deeply in debt and the creditor calls in the loan and he can't pay it back. And then the fellow that owes all the money remembers he has a friend that he's going to call on to see if his friend will help him. So it's a, a picture story of Christ's atonement. And so the friend comes to the creditor and says, if I pay off his debt, will you accept my payment? And the creditor says yes. And so then the friend turns to the guy that got in debt, and he said, if I pay this off for you, will you accept me as your What did the Jesus figure just do for you? He refinanced your loan. He didn't just pay it off and hand you a bill saying, paid in full. The Jesus figure says, I will set the terms They will not be easy, but they will be possible. In other words, you're going to make payments to Jesus now instead of to God the Father. You know, so there is not this sense in Mormonism of of truly being able to turn everything over to God and and be forgiven once and for all to know that you have eternal life. When you talk about this uh, grace that covers all this to a Mormon, of course, the immediate thing they come up with is, Oh, it's a license to sin. Now you can go out and do whatever you want. And I said, no, that's like saying, oh, well, now that I'm married, I got the piece of paper saying I'm married. I can go live like I want. I don't have to be respectful of my wife anymore. Uh, when you love someone, it will lead you into an honoring relationship. And if you have given your heart to Christ and entered into a love relationship with him, you're not looking for all the ways you can sin and skirt outside of the relationship. You're drawn into that. Just as in a marriage, if you truly love your mate, you're drawn into a closer relationship. You're not looking for ways to flirt with all the girls at the office. you know. So it isn't a license to sin. You're entering into a love relationship that draws you closer to him. So I'd encourage you as you speak to your Mormon friends to remember that, that forgiveness is a beautiful concept that they don't understand. That doesn't mean you've got to start witnessing to the bishop. You know, there are a lot of inactive Mormons out there. A lot of Mormons have got a big way to guilt. Mormonism is a guilt religion, see, because it got all kind of lists. Anytime you have a works-based religion, you've got long lists of do's and don'ts that burden a lot of people down. And a lot of inactive Mormons are dealing with a lot of guilt. So this man that I was talking to about all this, I explained, went over that story, the parable about the debtor and whether or not Jesus expects you to make payments to him or not. <laughs> and uh, he says, you know, this Christian thing is sounding better all the time. <laughs> uh, and so I have hope in time that he will come out and really see the beauty of coming to Christ for forgiveness, uh, that you don't need to stay on that treadmill to perfection. There's a phrase in the Book of Mormon that says we're saved by grace after all we can do. And when I bring up grace to a Mormon, this is the verse they'll say to me, we're saved by grace after all we can do. I said, boy, that's a real heavy one. Uh, did you do all you could do today? And they'll usually say, well, no. And I said, well, did you do all you, did, you could have done for God yesterday? No. Well, did you do all you could for God the day before? Well, no. This looks kind of hopeless. You know what I mean? <laughs> When, it, when is grace going to kick in if every day you don't do enough for God? So it's, it's a very depressing concept. The good news is Jesus paid it all, and we can enter into a love relationship, and we can get off the treadmill to perfection, be ourselves, and find grace in Christ. Amen. Thank you. Uh, if anyone needs to leave, they're welcome to do that. But if anyone wants to stay and ask me any questions about Mormonism, I'd be glad to try and answer whatever. Uh, the, I've been asked about everything. But <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is, who wrote the um, covenant, doctrine and covenants uh, and the pearl of great price? And the other one is, um, can you comment on this 
Lori and Jeff, he's in the news a lot. He's a Okay, two totally different kind of questions. All right, first one. Who wrote the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price? There are other two books of scripture. The Doctrine and Covenants is mainly Joseph Smith's revelations that he gave on a day-to-day basis of running the early Mormon church. And so it's all his revelations that God speaks to him, thus saith the Lord, and he has a scribe write it down. And so that's why it was bothering to me when Gerald showed me the revelations had been rewritten because this is God speaking in English to Joseph Smith, and some guy's sitting there writing it all down when Joseph dictates it. So why would you have to go back a few years later and rewrite it all, you know? I mean, this is direct communication stuff. Uh, so that's the Doctrine and Covenants. There are a couple of revelations by other prophets, but most of it's all just Joseph Smith's writings. The Pearl of Great Price is made up of mainly of uh, three different sections. You have the uh, Book of Moses, which has been written by Moses. It's kind of another account of Genesis. And Joseph Smith didn't claim to have any manuscript to translate. This was just direct revelation on the book of Moses. The next one is the book of Abraham, which is supposed to be the writings of Abraham, and it has another creation story in it, the difference from the Moses one. Uh, The book of Abraham uh, is supposed to be from papyri that were a genuine Egyptian papyrus that Joseph Smith bought in 1835 in Kirtland, Ohio, a traveling um, sideshow came through with a bunch of mummies and stuff and and Joseph the Mormon church paid a couple thousand dollars to buy these mummies and these scrolls and then Joseph turns around and says hey guys guess what in these mummies when when you took the scrolls out and unrolled them by darn right there you got Abraham's writings and he translated them the only problem was nobody could read Egyptian then and now they can uh, so now it doesn't read right. So you ask Mormon, oh, how come the book of Abraham doesn't read like the papyri? Now their scholars say, well, uh, just because he's looking at the papyri when he did the translation doesn't mean it has to agree with that because it came by revelation and God was revealing to him what Abraham wrote at some point and so it doesn't have to agree with that. Papyri. I said, well, then why would you pay two thousand bucks for it? You know, I mean, if it was if it wasn't the one you're really translating, why are you buying it? Uh, so, anyways, that's the problem with the Book of Abraham. Um, then the third part of the Book of Abraham is part of Joseph Smith's uh, inspired revision of the Bible. Uh, he did a revision of the Bible, and they only use certain parts, which I think is funny because if God's going to give you an updated version, why would you be selective on what parts you used? Um, and then Joe, part of Joseph Smith's story, how he started Mormonism. And that's the Pearl of Great Price. Okay, so that's their scripture. The Book of Mormon is supposed to be the story of the American uh, uh, Indians and uh, their ancestors. Did he write that too? Joseph Smith, I believe Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon. Yes, he used, it, it was a very common idea in Joseph Smith's day that the American Indians descended from the Israelites and they were part of the lost tribes of Israel. This was a common concept in Joseph's day. That's why people so readily accepted the Book of Mormon because it fit into the, a lot of people's speculation about the Indians anyways. Uh, so that's kind of their scriptures. Now, the other question was about Warren's, Jeff's, and the polygamists in Utah. Yes, we have problems with polygamy in Utah. Well, uh, your friendly neighbor grocer may be a polygamist. Uh, it's, it's not running rampant, uh, but there's like 50,000 people living polygamy today that somewhere or another tie into Mormonism. I mean, tie into Mormon beliefs, let me qualify that. They are not part of the regular LDS church. They are break-off groups that feel the Mormon church is in a state of apostasy because they don't live polygamy anymore, and that polygamy was an everlasting principle, and that the Utah church has gone astray, uh, and, and they got the true stuff. And so Warren Jeff's supposed to be a prophet for his group, but there's a lot of prophets out there. I mean, in fact, I've kind of thought at times, you know, I ought to write a book, True Prophets I've Known, because um, they come in the bookstore at different times. <laughs> uh, so there's quite a, bit, quite a few of them around. Uh, most of the pro- true prophets in Utah hold to the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, but they feel the church, uh, the big Mormon church, has gone astray. Okay, no, I think that covers that one. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, uh, the question was, do I still have copies of the original material that we sent out to people? Yes, and uh, I believe the University of Utah has quite a bit of it. I have copies in my files. Uh, Utah State University in Logan, Utah, I think, has a full collection of our early writings. 
Well, you can get the research that we currently did. I mean, our, our later upgrade, uh, we have a big book that I don't have with me called Mormonism, Shadow, or Reality that gives all the historical research that we compiled through the years. To see the very earliest things we did, uh, you'd have to contact one of those libraries or contact me or something. Uh, we don't Because we have enlarged our research through the years, we don't still sell the first things that we first wrote. Um, if you go to our website, which is utlm, <coughs> say that right, utlm.org, uh, we have a big website, and our last newsletter talked about how Gerald and I first got studying Mormonism, and it has a lot of that documentation in it. And our next newsletter will be a continuation of that story, and it'll have some of the quotes and documents from our earliest research. Uh, but yes, it can still be seen. Anyone can see what our first questions were and what our first writings were. But we compiled it into a big book uh, in 1987 that sort of pulls it all together in one place. It's like a phone book. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, the question is that the, the main story of the Book of Mormon transpires from 600 B.C. to 421 A.D. And it's supposed to be written in Reformed Egyptian, but the people are supposed to speak Hebrew, and they translate it into this language. Okay, so in 421, this guy Moroni, the last guy in the story, buries the plates in a hill in New York and uh, move forward a few hundred years. Uh, and Moroni, as an um, angel now, comes to Joseph Smith to tell him where he buried those records of his people. And then Joseph Smith is going to translate them. The average Mormon doesn't know about the translation process that actually happened, but the witnesses that left statements of how the translation was done tell that Joseph Smith in his teens had been involved in magic and money digging, and he had a magic rock that he'd found in a well that he used like a crystal ball gazing. He'd put this rock in his hat and look in it, and then he could tell you where to find buried treasure on the property. He used that same rock in the hat to translate the Book of Mormon, and the witnesses all tell this. This is the process of translation, he was looking at this rock in this hat, just like he did magic stuff. Um, so as God's revealing to him the translation in English of this ancient record, the English translation comes out with all these these and thous and a sense of answers, a sense of purpose. Um, it answers the tough questions in life. Uh, where did we come from? Oh, well, we lived with God up in heaven with him and Heavenly Mother at one point, you know. Um, well, what's the purpose of life? Well, it's to prepare ourselves for this eternal march of progression in the hereafter. So that they give the seemingness of giving answers to all of the great questions of life. Uh, and there is a comfort in the uh, absoluteness of it. You don't have ambiguity. It's true. Everything's black and white. And if you want absolute answers... <laughs> right. Mormonism has tremendous flaws that if you would have, be able to get someone to sit down and logically look at the progression of how Mormonism has been altered through the years, it's obvious it could not, could not be the work of God. The theology has changed through the years. I mean, this is the only true church with the only true gospel, but it doesn't say the same thing in years past. So how can this be the work of God? And, of course, a Mormon will say, well, God adds line upon line and precept upon precept, but, but he can't change the doctrine. And so if, if he tells Isaiah there wasn't any God before him, he can't later tell Joseph Smith, well, yeah, there was a dad before me and a grandpa and, you know, all of this. But Joseph faces everything. Um, it's, a, it's a willing blindness to me. They love the security of Mormonism 
There is a fellowship bond in Mormonism, but it's all works. It's all this effort and going to the temple and all doing busy work stuff uh, that, that seems to give purpose to their lives. But again, there is not a real concept of forgiveness. There is not a sense of the grace of God covering all their sin. If, if you're able to succeed at Mormonism, and some people seem to succeed at a fairly decent, pretty good moral, you're saved by grace after all you can do. You didn't do as good as you could have done. There is not one person that has done enough. There isn't one day you've done enough. So that hopefully as we share with our Mormon family and friends, in time they will start to feel uh, the weight of this. I, I mean, I've had Mormons in midlife crisis come in and talk to me about, you know, I was on this treadmill running to perfection, out, and all these years later, one day I woke up and I realized I'm no closer getting to be a god than I was 20 years ago. Uh, and so, you know, the reality sets in. But it's the Holy Spirit that draws them out. There's nothing we do to force someone to look into it or to question or to seek God. But as we have a chance to share our faith with them, the grace of Christ, the forgiveness of sin, the hope we have in him, that we aren't on the treadmill anymore, we are sinners saved by grace. Uh, and the and Mormons will always say, well, you know, what sins did you do to get kicked out of the Mormon church? I said, well, I did plenty of sin, but none of them got me kicked out of the Mormon church. Uh, what got me kicked out of the Mormon church was I asked for my name to be removed, and they excommunicated me because uh, I was teaching false doctrine, faith in Christ. See, that was false doctrine. <laughs> uh, and so I was put out for that reason. But uh, there is this inbreeding in Mormonism that if you start to question, you are the problem. It can never be the church. Yes? Um, would you conclude that Joseph Smith just straight up lied about everything or that a demonic spirit actually revealed these things? Oh, the question is... Uh, what really motivated Joseph Smith? Uh, was it a demonic spirit or did he obviously make it up himself? And that's a hard question to ask, I, uh, to answer. I don't know that we'll ever know. I think there are times when he knew he was lying, but at times he may have felt that he was doing something for God. There may have been a certain element of self-deception in this or demonic presence. I don't know. But I do believe I can show there were times when he knowingly lied um, he lied about polygamy. He lied about that to his wife and to the church. And he has to know that. So how much is fraud? How much is knowing? I don't know. Um, with that, I think we're going to call it an evening. And if anybody wants to ask me more questions afterwards, you're welcome to come up and talk with me and I'll let the rest of you go. So thanks a lot. <laughs>